since we're a national audience, maybe international, I thought that it would be important to bring our story, our new emerging story that's occurring here in South Florida to give an idea of some of the challenges that we're faced with as a community. And when I say community, it's the citizens, it's us as practitioners and functional health practitioners trying to grapple with what we're seeing or what we're anticipating is emerging in terms of the Zika uh, epidemic. This is the mosquito, Aegis aegypti, uh, and actually a beautiful mandala, that's the virus. This is not political, <laughs> even though we're on the eve of the election. The blue represents the states that have now had Zika uh, come into their communities. And so this really is, we are the microcosm, but it's really becoming part of the larger uh, pandemic that we're seeing. And unfortunately, due to environmental changes and other things, we will probably be seeing this emerge uh, again. Right now, we're, we're moving into the dormant season, so we're not wearing our gear. And it's important that we think about our prevention. This, these are the cases that have been reported in the United States. The darker uh, blue uh, indicates higher uh, case uh, reporting. And that was as of October. We all know the symptoms, just for those that want to review. Uh, joint pain, conjunctivitis, rash, and fever. Uh, case study, just as an idea of a woman who is healthy, who's uh, thinking about having a family, who has children, who lives in Miami at the epicenter of the outbreak, and is fearful about not getting bitten by a mosquito. We've heard about the risks in pregnancy. Uh, we're not going to discuss that this evening. There's the CDC and other websites that one could go to for that information. But I think the important piece is what do we do to protect ourselves in the healthiest way possible? And also as practitioners, what do we advise the clients and patients that we're working with? Because we have a challenge and it's a dilemma. On one hand, we don't want anyone to get the Zika virus, whether it be uh, a child, an elderly person, or a woman who is pregnant or going to get pregnant. And on the other hand, we don't want to expose uh, ourselves or others to the environmental chemicals that we hear so much about that, especially in functional medicine, we're very concerned about the toxic body burden and what that could mean uh, in, in long-term health and also in the short term. So this is classic of our younger population in Miami, in Miami Beach, in the neighborhoods where Zika has been found. And there is great concern. This is the CDC guidelines, uh, basic, obvious, uh, you know, wear protective clothing, stay in air conditioning in the summer and uh, use clothing that's been treated with chemicals, and that's okay, but not to get it on your skin. Kind of seems hard to wear the clothing without it touching your skin. Sleep under mosquito netting. I don't know anyone personally who has been able to do that. And use repellents. And the CDC says that these insect repellents are safe and effective for pregnant and breastfeeding women. So this is a big question mark of how we approach this with our patients. One of the other things that we're living with here in South Florida, which I think parallels the, uh, the Zika growth, is that we have rising tides. Although our governor and our senator does not believe in climate change, this is at uh, no rain on an evening in Miami on October 9th during the moon phase. And the streets are flooded because the water's rising and coming through the storm drains and flooding the streets. And the residual of that water stays in pools for a long time. And these are the favorite breeding grounds of mosquitoes and the mosquito that carries Zika. Oops. Am I able to go back? 
yes, I can't forget Miami fashion. So these are some of the nettings that some people are wearing, and especially around the feet, because the mosquito actually stays low uh, to the ground, does not fly high. Humans are its favorite uh, source. Uh, and so uh, there are many fashion statements coming from that. We are using aerial spraying as our major source in Miami, and that has been very controversial. Uh, is it an effective tool for mosquitoes? If you look at Puerto Rico, if you look at the European Union, many have said that this is ineffective. And at the same time, we've been having multiple sprayings and often without public notice. So there are people, early morning joggers, for example, uh, who go out at dawn, which is when the spraying has occurred. So there's a lot of concern about that. And the spray that they've been using is NALID. I'm sure most people know about that by now. It's an organophosphate in the pesticide family. And it in itself has detrimental effects on neurological function and on the brains of the unborn or the new, the, in, in utero. Uh, so that when we're exposed, this young woman, as in the case study, when she's exposed to the pesticides, there's always the possibility that that will affect the growing fetus. And so there are other sprays. This is what's going on in gardens that the, uh, the county is using, larvicides. Their pellets or granules or sprays. They usually are used around pools and collected water gutters and uh, standing water, which is what we have a lot of. And then there's the genetically modified mosquitoes. And if anyone saw the headline on the Miami, in the Miami Herald the day before yesterday, GMOs are being considered, GMO mosquitoes are being considered now in Miami Beach as another source of uh, killing the, the Zika larva. Now, the thing is, is it's considered a mosquito birth control. We don't yet know what that means if we are bitten and infected by a mosquito carrying it. These are just questions. This is just to raise the question as practitioners and providers, how do we begin to become informed and how to share with our practitioner community uh, the challenges and the, uh, the benefits of these treatments. One of the things that happens with the aerial spraying, and I think it's really important, and with the larvicides, is that it's also killing off the natural predators, the wasps and other insects that are natural uh, biological, oops, biological determinants of keeping the, the Zika virus uh, at bay. And then, I, again, the mosquitoes present one risk and the pesticides present another. We know about the dose of exposure, the timing, the combinations. And so when we say that something is safe, how do we as practitioners do an environmental assessment to really know what else the people that we're working with have been exposed to? And that's a really big piece. And, and do we know, these are questions, is it safe to use insecticides during pregnancy? The CDC says it, it is safe. And yet there, there are reports in OBGYN journals and looking at what happens with exposure. So the good news is there are repellents and other things that could be used. And I think it's important to leave with a thought that rather than spraying deep on a child every day when they go to school. Maybe there is another repellent that's safe and herbal and can be used. And we have to weigh the benefit and the risk. And as David Perlmutter said, I think that we need to take a step back and recognize that we should always look at these interventions in terms of risk versus benefit. And, is, and what are they? And that's a question that we need to also ask our patients and our clients, for them to determine what they feel is, is most effective. There are many people that are not using anything and they run the risk of being exposed to Zika. On the other hand, there are people that are bathing themselves in pesticides every day. So how do we as clinicians begin to ask the questions and determine uh, with that person and, and create a, a treatment plan. 
So our concerns as practitioners is to know how do we do an environmental assessment. I wonder how many of you here and in the, in the audience out there do environmental assessments to really understand the, uh, the synergy of many chemicals uh, at one time that the person might be exposed to. And how do we begin to create community here so we could really have the information that we need to make more informed decisions with our clients. Body burden study that was done with the environmental working group in the American Red Cross several years ago said that newborns are born with over 200 chemicals in their umbilical cord and in their own exposures. So, and that's through the mom. So we know that we're already uh, overburdened at when we come into this world, and these are some uh, studies that have really looked at the neurotoxicity of, of pesticides. So on one hand, we want to protect ourselves, and on the other hand, are we uh, exposing ourselves to a higher risk of ADD in children or early Alzheimer's in adults? We don't know, but they're questions that as clinicians we need to be asking. Uh, these are so, this is from Lancet Neurology. Uh, Dr. Landrigan is the head of environmental health as a pediatrician at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, and he himself has written and expressed deep concerns about the neurological and neurobehavioral components of exposures to a variety of chemicals in, in childhood and in utero. This is, again, to bring it home, this is Miami, that there was a very big movement to stop the use of NALID, and the city listened, and it was citizens, and it was practitioners, and politicians that came together and met for a series of meetings, and even confronted the county's guidelines and recommendations to try to find a healthier way to stop the use of the NALID spraying. It's still in process what the next, uh, when the spraying will continue, perhaps next season, next mosquito season, but there really have been uh, a lot, there's been a lot of dialogue, and I think it's a model of community action and community coming together. And again, Miami Beach is at the epicenter of this. So to end, I just wanted to say that there are chemical and plant-based repellents. Uh, there are several journal articles comparing uh, some of the DEET and other pesticides, insecticides, to uh, essential oils and other herbs, and it's really worth exploring. They're safe, they're eco-friendly, and uh, they've been tested in several uh, studies that have shown, for example, the number one litsia has been identified in its, in, as the most effective. Uh, here's a, an article that talks about it. This is what it looks like. And it's a shrub that comes from China, Indonesia, and Taiwan, and it's been used for uh, millennia as a way of protecting people from uh, other, other infectious diseases. And so the question is, are essential oils effective? And here's another study that looked, two studies that looked at the behavior, the response of the mosquito to the essential oils. And mosquitoes are very sensitive to smell. They love perfume. So if you're wearing perfume, it's more likely that they will be attracted to that person. If they're wearing an essential oil, it's a repellent and they will not be uh, as, as ready to, to sting. So, this just is the ending to say that DEET and DEPA have shown significant, uh, have been just as effective the essential oils in being able to protect from uh, being bitten by the mosquito. So we need to practice the precautionary principle as practitioners to really think about the do no harm and what is our best course of action working with clients and patients and to evaluate the risks and benefits. 
We all need to start implementing environmental assessments, not just for these pesticides, but in general, for all of the exposures that we have in our modern world, and to continue to be educated and to update with our patients so they're aware of any anything, any untoward side effects or the benefits of using some of them. And to collaborate with community and local government. We've talked about community and I think this is another issue as a public health issue that can bring us all together to really think about the strategies and think about what some of you may be doing that might be effective in the uh, protection of our, of our patients and our families and ourselves. And we need to get involved in advocating for safer methods for controlling this as we move forward. Thank you.